All right, good afternoon, folks. <clears throat> uh, hopefully, we don't have uh, the same kind of issues we had last time. It might have been related to my camera, but I did do some uh, reverting and stuff on my Windows version. So hopefully, uh, hopefully, there won't be any issues. There weren't any this morning, so uh, we'll see about today. <clears throat> so there's a couple things I, I want to talk about. Uh, I did put up the uh, game design document too, so essentially you have you have a week a week to do this one. It's basically the same as last time, except uh, the theme is going to be combined combined to incompatible genres. So rather than an unconventional weapon, it is is combined to in incompatible genres. This was the theme for Let Them Dare Forty One. Um, if you have some trouble coming up with with some ideas, uh, you can certainly go look at the games that were created in, in, in LD41, but uh, there is a uh, sort of game genre mashup generator that uh, that you can download as well that just takes a list of a bunch of game genres and slaps two of them together. Uh, it was something to help folks with uh, with that let them dare. Uh, it, it is free. It's 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 from itch.io so you can like donate to the to the developer but it it is free you just had to click like no thanks just take me to the download thing and and you can download it so if that's something that you want if you if you don't have any sort of great ideas then uh, you can certainly use something like that i did want to show you so I, I i did do uh, i did take part in let em dare 41 so i just want to show you real quick what my take on this was for the sort of 48 hour uh game jam uh so it was this so it was called uh, breakout typing <clears throat> So uh, as you can imagine, it was a uh, typing game and it was a breakout game at the same time. Now I did convert this from like Unity 5 something to uh, to the current version. So I did notice some issues. I think something with some of my colliders or something got a little screwy in the conversion because it, it did work before, but this is in uh, play mode. So we have our little ball, it's gonna bounce around. Sometimes it leaves the area for whatever reason. Uh, but when you do play, uh, what else goes here? Yep. Uh, there's a little bit of music in the background, uh, but essentially you start with the ball on your on your paddle. You have this sort of standard breakout stuff, but in order to move the paddle, you can only move it between the left and the right, and you do that by typing the words. So it's sort of a typing game plus uh, uh, plus breakout, which, by the way, isn't that great. Uh, it's it's if you're not a quick typer, you know, sort of grab this stuff right away and start moving. If the ball is going to come down in the center, then you sort of have to start typing and and moving the moving the ball uh, or moving the paddle so that it intercepts with the ball and stuff. So, yeah, Nick, type type the I've I've seen I've seen very sort of typing games. Uh, I think I think I know the one you're 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 talking about where it's sort of first person shooter ish. Uh, but it's sort of a typing game that you you type and it then it's able to like kill kill the bad guys. So that was that was sort of what I went with, went went with this. It was kind of it was kind of fun to do the breakout part plus learn some of the, the sort of typing stuff. It's basically just a text box here, so your cursor is sort of always selected on it, and the ball itself is just uh, it's just a sphere with a particle effect as the uh, trail. So so that's this is what I mean by combined two incompatible genres. Now don't go for something sort of super crazy in terms of the genres. Like, uh, I, I don't know, it would probably, uh, it, you'd probably need more than sort of four days-ish to, uh, to make a sort of complete RTS or something. So remember that the, that, that the game design doc is, is meant for sort of a short uh, game jam style thing because this is the last one sort of for just, just by itself. The next one that you write, the last one that you write, will be part of the final project for for the class. So, uh, so think about it as sort of a short game jam. Come up with two genres that are sort of not as compatible. They don't have to be completely polar opposites, but something that you don't normally see together, right? So, uh, like another example, right, would be like turn-based racing. Like you don't normally see a turn-based racing game. So, uh, so if, if you come up come up with a, with a few ideas, uh, think about the scope, think about the amount of time that 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 I sort of, I sort of say here, that sort of four days, and uh, you can use your previous uh, uh, GDD and, and or the one from uh, Volcano Island or or the ones from the other games that I've posted stuff about uh, to to be inspiration for this. So. <clears throat> So I'll think about a couple of incompatible genres. I found this one. I didn't actually like this one when I first saw it for Let Em Dare 41, but it was actually fun to think about uh, the different types of games uh, to make. And again, if you want other ideas and stuff, you can go to the to, to see the games that were created for Let Em Dare 41 because there was a lot of cool ones out there uh, as well. Okay. So any any questions on the any questions on this uh, GDD uh, assignment? Okay. 
All right. So yeah. So this again, you have you have a week. You'll just upload the PDF on on Blackboard. So you don't have to worry about coding it. You, you still do this as a team. So of course, not everyone has to has to create their own version. So it's the same as the last one. All right. Let me uh, actually close this out because I just wanted to show off just just briefly sort of what what you can do in just a couple of days with uh, with that sort of theme. And let me actually open up uh, the one for today. So I think I don't remember what I named this one. Well, we'll just go into this Unity Art Lecture. Basically, you can use the same lecture that you did uh, last time. I don't remember if I named this something different. I don't see it. So we'll, we'll just- Did you call it Shader Graph Lecture? I know we we had we had that one open to look at the HDRP for the URP one. I don't remember which one I used it for. This this one this one's basically the same thing. I just don't remember which one I used last time. Uh, as long as long as it's URP, and, I, and actually for today it doesn't actually even matter because we're just talking about importing uh, art assets basically. So so yeah. So most of the time when you have your art assets. They're going to be either 2D or 3D. And you're going to create, for 2D assets, you're going to create like atlases like this. So I think Unity uses the term atlas. Uh, long, long ago, I, I, I learned it as like a sprite sheet. So you know, depending on the terminology you want to use. But something like this, where you're going to have a whole bunch of different uh, different assets, sprites, you'll, you'll put them together, you'll make a sprite sheet, and then you want to bring that into Unity. And the snowman from the first game was essentially a, a sprite sheet. It wasn't a like a regular sprite sheet with a whole bunch of sort of the same sized graphics all sort of set up in, in a rectangle, but it did have multiple sprites that we used to help us with animation. But let's, let's say you're making something where you, you know, you're making a tile based game or something, right? You might have buildings and, and furniture or whatever, uh, you know, think, think games like, you know, Final Fantasy or Pokemon or something where you have a tile set that you, that you add a bunch of stuff to. And actually in a few weeks after the third game, we will actually talk about uh, the sort of automatic tile set stuff uh, in, in uh, Unity. So we will actually talk more about tile sets in the future. The other types of assets you're going to have are most likely 3D assets. So we're going to talk about both of those today. Uh, you may consider fonts as sort of assets, but typically you just you just use them uh, in in whatever text stuff you're writing. So typically, sort of the font isn't a normal asset in the sense that it's something you have to like import and mess around with all the import settings to get it to look right. Typically, it will just work right out of the box. So. The assets that you're going to see most of the time are going to be 2D assets that are going to be sprites or your 3D assets from some sort of 3D modeling program. So I actually want to start uh, today and actually, let's make this full screen. Zip out when we need to. We're actually going to start in Blender today. Uh, I don't expect you to, to know, know stuff about Blender, to use Blender. I don't expect any of that. But in any 3D modeling program, you will have the option to export whatever models you create. So if you get into a little bit of 3D modeling, you watch some of uh, Grant Abbott's tutorials or something. Uh, he makes a, for some of his beginner tutorials, he has he has some characters and some like objects like like a well and, and like a sea shack and stuff that he puts together. And if you want to put something like that in your game after you make it, then you're going to need to export it in a format that Unity can handle. So that, that, that little Stargate mesh, I'm going to show you what that looks like in Blender in a second. We want to export it in either FBX or OBJ. Uh, either one of those will, will work fine. I prefer FBX because the materials are actually embedded into the file itself. Uh, object, depending on how you do it, they may not be, and they might be like separate files. Uh, so that's, I'd rather have it all embedded and then be able to unembed it if I want to, rather than having it sort of automatically not, not embedded. Uh, that does mess with like file sizes and stuff. So there are trade-offs, of course. But uh, traditionally, I, I, like, I like FBX. I think the uh, the uh, uh, Magic of Voxel, I think it only does uh, OBJ. So that's what you would have to use in that case. So we so I'm, so I'm going to show you what, what this looks like to export a, a model. Most 3D modeling software is probably going to be the same. Uh, Blender is Blender's obviously free. Uh, you can get a student license, or like an educational license to Maya. So I, I do actually have Maya on this computer, but I don't know like as much about it. And, and you could probably get 3D Studio Max and stuff as well. Uh, back in the day, like back in like my high school days. Um, so this was like 
you know, late nineties, early two thousands, uh, three studio max was like the main 3d model for video games. Like if you, if you were going into video games, you were, you learned 3d studio max. Uh, when I first learned 3d modeling, I used a, we used a program called Rhino, uh, because of, for, for various reasons, but, uh, I did learn a little 3d studio max and a little bit of Lightwave, uh, which was Lightwave was used for like movies and, and TV and stuff. If you watch the, the Battlestar Galactica, the, the one with Edward James almost, so the newer one, uh, they used Lightwave for all their, for all their, uh, uh, 3D models and animation and all that kind of stuff. Nowadays, it's mainly Maya for pretty much everything. Uh, 3D Studio, Studio Max still exists. Uh, obviously, I think Rhino still exists. Uh, a whole bunch of these others still exist, but Maya is sort of the main one. So if you do like some of the art aspects and you want to learn what the actual artists for games use, then Maya might be one to think about. But of course, it does cost money unless you get the educational license. So Blender, that, that's where most sort of indies, indies sit. Uh, it has pretty much, it has most of the same features uh, and, and it's free. So. so again, FBX is is sort of the normal one you, you want to go for. Uh, there's lots of export options that I'm going to show you in a second. Uh, I'm not a 3D modeling software expert. I used to do stuff long ago with, like I said, Lightwave and 3 Studio Max and uh, Rhino, but uh, I haven't done major stuff in, in years. I used to make little like space battle things when I was in high school. Uh, so it's a good idea to take a look at some tutorials as well if you can't figure out how to export something properly or something like that. It's, it's a good to, tech, to check uh, uh, various tutorials as well because I don't know all of, these, all of these pieces of software. So here is Blender. Uh, this is the, the sort of flat shaded view of that uh, of that of that Stargate. Uh, you know, no, nothing crazy here. We can get the, turn the materials on so you can sort of see what that looks like. And then the rendered view here is is this one. So so after you've modeled something, so say you've you've created something, it it, it, it looks awesome, whatever. Then you want to export it. So for Blender, you go to File Export. And it has a bunch of options. FBX is what we're looking for. It also does OBJ. That is also Wavefront. So if you see export as a Wavefront object, that is the OBJ. Wavefront was a, a format from you know, years ago. It's been around a long time. But uh, uh, FBX is typically typically the one I go for these days. And I already I already have a a, a file named gate.fbx, but I'll I'll just re-export it. In Blender, you can choose what to export. So you can limit to like selected objects. So if you have a scene with like a huge amount of objects, you can just select one and export only that. So it'd be so so it makes it a little easier to not export a gigantic scene as one object. You can separate it out if you want to. Typically, uh, typically you basically deselect everything here except for mesh. So I don't want the camera. I don't want the lamp or the lights. I don't want any of the uh, armature here, which I think this usually has to do with. Uh, uh, like animation type stuff. I don't want to export any empties. I don't want to export any. There's nothing other that I want to ask, export. So mesh typically is what you're going to want to go for. If you have animations, then you you might you probably want to export the armature as well. Uh, transform stuff here. Typically, this is the this is the way that it's already set the way you want it. You can adjust the forward and the up if you want to. So in Unity, if we come in here. In Unity, note that uh, note that okay. Let's see. Let's that away. Note that Y is up in Unity. So you just have a, a generic scene. Y is up. So if you want this sort of rotated correctly, then we're saying here, okay. When I export this, export the up direction as Y and the forward direction as negative Z. So negative Z is sort of the forward, Y is up. So you can change these. They, they give you that option just in case whatever you're going to import it in has different settings here, but this should be okay. You can make your own preset. So if you find that you're always having to change some of these options, you can define like a Unity preset and just grab the preset when you whenever you need to export something to Unity. But uh, typically this is this, this is what you're gonna want. You're gonna want the, the, the only the mesh, and the scale can stay the same unless you need to scale it when it's uh, maybe you want to make it smaller or something when it imports in, you can do that. Uh, and then Z negative Z forward and Y up tend to be just fine. So I do the export X uh, FBX and then I have the model. So on Blackboard, I've given you this model, this particular uh, model in the, the Blender file. 
So it has so basically what we were just looking at. I've given you the output file in, in, in case you don't have Blender. I've given you the gate.fbx. And I don't know if this one, I don't know if I exported this one with the lights and stuff. So that's something that I might have to look at. And then uh, also a sprite sheet that we're going to look at later. So you can grab these assets here. Essentially, in Unity, we're going to take the FBX and drag it into a models folder. And I actually may already have it in here in this one. Yeah, so, so, so I already have it in here. Um, again, you can just grab it. So wherever this is at. So I have a folder here where I have my gate.fbx. You can just grab it and drop it right in. I'm not going to do it here since I already have it. And what you can usually see with it, and it looks like this one does have the camera and the light. So I'm going to show you some stuff related to that. If you did export the camera and the light, uh, I can show you how you can uh, uh, basically turn those things off. But notice how it also has materials. So the materials are all embedded. And it has the geometry as well. So here's like all right, a mesh collider, mesh renderer. Uh, the name of the stuff here was cube. I didn't change much of it with cube. And then it also has... Uh, I think this is part of the, uh, the the mesh as well, although I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, it's probably something related to the mesh, and then this is something uh, related to the actual object itself. So we have the mesh, we have the materials, we have the actual camera and light from the actual scene itself, and we have the uh, the, the the object that this would be if I create if I dragged this into the scene. Let me actually grab that other one uh, and bring it into the folder for that. Grab the other one and bring it in and show you that uh, I didn't export the lights with that one. Go. So I'm going to grab this one and bring it in. So it should give me this gate one. And if I open it up, notice that there's no lights in here. There's no light, no camera. So this one I set, I didn't, I didn't sort of do it correctly in that I exported the camera and the lights as well. So I'll show you what happens if you do that. And depending on the modeling program, it might not be easy to export without the camera or lights, or there, there may not be an option to turn those off. So it's worth knowing how you can deal with that. So if I just take one of these, let's say I take the one that had the, the camera and lights in it, and I drag it in, and here it is. So the up is Y, and whatever, whatever was forward is negative Z. So I probably had sort of this direction here is forward, like positive X in, in, uh, in Blender was, was forward. So that's in sort of the negative X direction. Of course, I, you, you can always go in and, and rotate this stuff. You know, there's, there's no reason why you can't uh, rotate and uh, scale and all that other kind of stuff in here as well, once it's in, once it's, once it's in Unity. If I look at the hierarchy, Notice that it has a camera, a cube, which the cube is the name of the actual thing itself, the, the mesh, and it has the light. So the easiest thing to do, if you just import something in, you drag it in, and you notice that it has a camera and a light, is you can just deactivate them. It's worth doing at very minimum for the camera because you don't necessarily need to have multiple cameras in your scene and you don't want to accidentally grab the wrong camera if you're if you're setting stuff up or you're like oh the camera's right here but it turns out it's the camera that was set up with the gate so the easiest thing to do is just turn them off from here just completely deactivate them uh you can uh you should be able to de to delete them okay here's here here it says not because it's uh they yeah, have to unpack the prefab. So we might have to mess around with the prefab in here if we want to mess with it. So that's why turning them off is usually just the easiest thing to do if you don't end up exporting uh, where, where you don't have them. All right, so we have our gate. And let me go back to the slides here. Make sure I'm going to stay sort of in order here. Yeah, so grab the FBX. I, I mentioned a Git repo here, but I, I, didn't, I didn't put these in the Git repo. I just put them on, the, on Blackboard. All right, so the other thing to look at with this is the import settings, because it's not just the model and the export settings that we want to mess with. It's the import settings into Unity. And this lets us change a bunch of stuff as well. So there, there's a few tabs that we're going to take a look at, model, rig, animation, and materials. Most likely, model and materials are going to be the most important ones for you. Uh, if you do add a rig and do some animations, then you'd want to definitely take a look at the animation uh, and rig tab. So I'll show you those uh, as well, even though I, uh, we, we haven't used them. So if I just click on one of the models in my asset folder, so I click on one of these guys here, it has a whole bunch of options for me here. We have those four tabs I mentioned. 
and we have the sort of the sort of the base model tab. So this lets me deal with the scale as well. So let's say I, I make a whole bunch of models and I realize that well in Blender I made some models at a certain scale and then maybe I made actually made some models bigger. Well for each of those models, rather than dragging them in and then changing the scale in the transform, I could just change it so the scale is different in the import. So maybe I want to have this be five or something. I do have to click apply here. And then it should apply to ones that uh, I would newly grab in. So this one's five. So I bring it in. Now this is much bigger. So it won't apply to one you've already dragged in. But if you drag in more, then it will apply. So now, so now this is much bigger because I set it so that here it says one centimeter file to 0 0.01 meter unity. And so I've changed this the scale factor to five. So now the scale factor in unity is going to be five times bigger than it was uh, sort of the by by the units in, uh, in in Blender. So you can mess around with the scale factor. Uh, by default, of course, it comes in as one. And actually, it looks like it changed it there. So I don't know why I didn't change it when I went bigger. So you can mess around with that uh, and, and uh, change the scale sort of on the fly. There's a few things here that will mostly be imported just fine, but notice that the cameras and the lights are things that you can take away as well. So let's see. Yeah, so now there is no camera or light in here. So if you go in and mess with the import settings, you don't even have to worry about the camera and lights. You can just say that I don't want to want to make sure that they're not important. So that is another way to do it. Uh, Again, it's you do have to go into the, you do have to mess with the import settings, but you know, you have less stuff in your in your hierarchy, so you can do that. If there is some sort of hierarchy associated with the object itself, so maybe I have a whole bunch of in Blender, I might have might have had a hierarchy of objects or something. You can choose to preserve that as well. Most of the time, you're not going to have to mesh mess with the meshes area. Uh, Mesh compression. If you have a if you have a a high poly mesh, you can do stuff with that. If you intend to change the mesh in any way in code or in a shader, you'll want to have the read write enabled. If you don't intend to ever change the the mesh, like the vertices of the mesh, then you want to have this off uh, because it it the, there's more memory that gets used when it's on and all that kind of stuff. Uh, typically, everything else here is fine. Generate colliders is something you can do. So we do this. And it'll generate a mesh collider and have it active already for me. So if you need to have a mesh collider in your object, so let's take a look here. If I take a look at the take a look at the mesh mesh collider. Uh, it's not anything. It should wrap right around the mesh. So it's exactly the the collider is exactly the mesh. For things like boundaries in your game or something like walls in your game, you're typically not going to use a mesh collider. But for something like uh, for some, something like the character themselves, the character in your game, like you have a 3D character, you probably want a mesh collider because you don't want somebody shooting sort of past you and then you're using a square coll a cube collider or something and and it hits you. So typically, mesh colliders are used for important things where you want to make sure that the collisions are as accurate to the mesh as possible. The reason why you don't use them all the time, or why you shouldn't use them all the time, is because it's a much more difficult calculation to determine if there was a collision. So it's more computationally expensive to compute a collision based on the exact geometry than it is if I just put a cube around this. So try to use mesh colliders when they're needed and, and forget about them and use a simpler collider when, when they're not. But in the import settings, you can have that uh, already set up properly for you. Uh, geometry wise, you most of the time never want to keep quads. Uh, it'll typically convert them when they render anyway to triangles. That's that's what that's what GPUs render are triangles. Uh, you can keep quads depending on how you want to deform meshes. But the reason why quads are are not a usually a good thing is because they're not always planar. So you can imagine taking a piece of paper. It's flat, right? But as soon as you lift one corner, or one vertex, then it is no longer planar. It's no longer flat. A triangle, that's never the case. You can never have a non-planar triangle. Because as soon as you take a vertex from a triangle and move it, you still have a flat triangle. It's just at a different angle. So typically, you want to 
only use triangles. So keeping quads, I've never had a situation where I've needed to keep quads. Uh, if you have extra vertices, this will get rid of them. So typically that that's on. Uh, the only other useful one or sort of uh, interesting one in here is some of the smoothing that can go on. So if you have uh, if you have uh, uh, triangles or quads that are at certain angles, they can show a smooth surface rather than a uh, a sharp corner. And so in this case, the smoothing angle is 60 degrees. So if I have uh, some geometry that is less than 60 degrees in front in it for its angle, then it looks going to look smooth. So that's another one that you can mess around with this and turn this on or off. So I can sort of show you here because I have my gate. So we have we have here these uh, this geometry here. So it looks very, uh, we have this sort of sharp edge on our geometry. Well, if I increase the smoothing angle, and I guess, well, actually, this may not actually do what I want it to do here. Let's do some angle. Okay, that looks like you're not. So it should be less than 60 degrees. Jeez. All right, well, this is definitely something to mess around with. Some of these settings here to see if we can get the smoothing that we want. Yeah, I thought this had it in there. Maybe it's not. All right. Well, it's 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 something you can mess around with. Blender has all these settings and stuff too. In Blender, you can set smoothness and stuff. Uh, it looks like I'll just have to figure out what's going on with the smoothing here. Uh, but that's that, that's basically what I mean. You can look at different things at different angles. Will will sort of look smooth and rendered rather than having this uh, this sort of sharp corner, which is something I probably have to mess with a little more. But that's that's sort of the basic idea of the, the stuff here for the geometry. There's a few others in here like tangents. How do you how you, how you calculate the tangents? And some of that has to do with uh, how you're going to put textures on them and all that kind of stuff. Uh, typically, things like normals are are imported. Uh, that's normals would be the direction that the face is facing. So the normal here on this face is out. So the normal is sort of out in this direction, uh, perpendicular to the face itself. If I flip the normal, then I'm going to see the back side of the polygon, which typically are not rendered. So I would see sort of an open space here. It would look like I was looking through the gate. So uh, normals, if your normals are correct in your 3D program, then importing them is, is usually fine. So you don't have to mess with a lot of stuff in here. Uh, it's If you know some stuff about 3D modeling, you'll you'll recognize a, a bunch of this stuff, particularly with the geometry and, and, and the scene stuff. But really mess with the scale factor. Make sure camera and lights are not uh, are not imported. And then see if you want to mess with any of the sort of tangents or smoothing angles or, or normals. All right, for the rig, uh, there's there's a few options here. Uh, it lets you basically import a rig. So if a rig is part of the FBX, then you can uh, you you can define define certain aspects of the rig itself. So a rig, by a rig, I mean think of the think of the the bones in your body. You can set that sort of thing up in a 3D modeling program. So you can set up bones that correspond to specific areas. Of your model. You move the bone, it moves part of the model. So that's how you can easily make like running animations or moving animations for things. Uh, so this allows you to import that rig so that you can do that sort of motion with the rig in Unity instead of just in your 3D modeling program. So so there's a few things here, usually like generic or humanoid is, 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 uh, is, is going to work. Uh, you don't normally need to do anything with the avatar def definition, uh, you can either create one from the model or you can just leave it. And then uh, there's, there's sort of skin weights. So the skin is the model itself. And uh, you sort of got to get more into rigging to sort of understand exactly what, what these do. But in principle, they allow you to import a rig that you've created in another 3D modeling program. So if you get into rigging your models, then then you'll you'll mess around with this a little bit and have the rig be, be sent in. Now, you don't always want to do that. You don't always want to set up uh, a rig and then bring it into Unity and mess around with it in Unity. You might just create the animation in Blender or in Maya. Just create a running animation in Blender. Awesome. So you can bring that animation in. There are no animations in this model, so it does not have them listed here. But if you had animations in your model, then it would list the animations. You can bring them in, and you can actually create them as our actual uh, we created uh, animation right here. You can bring them in as actual animations to your uh, to your animation controller, 
and then set up all of your uh, transitions that we did that we've done before. So uh, they, it allows you to do that very easy to do. So if you get into any sort of animation, bring it into unity is usually not a problem. All right, the other one, if you're not dealing with rigs or animation, the other important one is materials. So you don't change much of this usually unless you want to mess around with the embedded materials. So typically you're going to use the embedded ones, which is what I have here. I have uh, sort of a darker brown, uh, a lighter brown, and the, the sort of gate material, the, the glowy gate material piece. But I don't have direct access to these. Like I can't, I can't change anything in here. Everything's all grayed out. Uh, when I come in here, I see a couple of uh, materials here. I see, I see these materials here, but I can't do anything with them. Uh, so typically what you do, if you want to mess around with the materials, so let's say I want to have something where when the gate gets activated, the material changes from a blue to a green or something. The, the, the glowy material changes from a blue to a green. Well, I need access to this ring material shader to change the color, to change the base map or maybe the emission map or something. I need to be able to change that. So what you can do when you import these is you can actually say extract materials. And I think I might already have them. No, I don't. Okay, good. So in my models, I click on this and say extract materials. Now it's going to ask me, okay, where, where do you want to save these? So that's, so that's what this window is doing. So we're going to put it in the materials folder. And I'm going to say select folder. And it goes through. Now take a look at my model. It no longer has the materials. It's just the mesh now. The materials are gone from the model because I extracted them. Now here, still in the import settings for materials, it still it shows base material, base material one, and ring material. So it shows those three materials, but they are now here in my materials folder. So now I can go in and I can mess around with them. I can go in and change them and do whatever I want by, I could use code, I could do it manually, whatever I need to do. So that's, that is a typical thing that I do, uh, especially if I need to change the material for any reason. If it's just like a basic wall or a basic ground or something that I'm never gonna change, all right, I'll just leave them embedded. But if I do want to change them, if I wanna change the color, if I wanna have stuff sort of flicker or something, then yeah, I'm gonna need to go and, and change the materials or e extract the materials and then either change them or swap them out. Uh, on the fly. So now I have access directly to those materials. So this, this, is, a, this is an important aspect of that, this materials uh, tab. Being able to extract them, then you're good to go. You can mess around with as much as you want, and you can even remap very easily. So if I had another material, if I'm like, well, I don't want this ring material, I want this the material, then I can throw it in there. And depending on, I don't remember what this, what this looks like here. Uh, yeah, we wanted to apply that, which I did not do. And okay. There we go. So here's our material. Yeah, game our camera's sort of way off of that. So here's that material, that new green material that I just uh, that I just added. And of course, I can always put the ring material black back. And the reason why it's 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 not glowy is because it's uh, dark. It's it's not it's not an emission material. Okay, so so that's that's sort of how you mess around with the materials in your objects. Potentially, you might have dozens of materials. So. That means you probably want some other organization here. You might want to take a folder or something and have like, oh, these, these are the gate materials and, and export them into there if, if you need them. Okay, so I don't know how useful specifically this will be because I don't know how many folks have wanted to mess around with some 3D modeling things, but there are a lot of options to mess around with. Again, most of the time, you're just going to be dealing with the materials or the model options, materials for extracting them. Uh, from an FBX, if, 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 you, if you have an OBJ, there's actually a, there's separate files for it. So you can put those directly into your, your materials folder. Uh, and then import for the model settings for things like if you, if you have the camera or the lights, you can get rid of those, not import them. And then some of the other stuff here for, uh, for the geometry and stuff. So hopefully that was at least a, a decent uh, overview. Uh, so if you use it in the future, it hopefully won't be sort of like a scary thing like, oh, what do I do with like, like oh, materials? What do I got to deal with with that? So hopefully it's just at least uh, uh, something that potentially could help in the future if you want to do some 3D stuff. All right, back to here. I think uh, I mentioned a few things here, things like scale factor, all that sort of stuff. So I, I mentioned a few things in the slide as well, just uh, the sort of the, the 
uh, the highlights of some of the stuff, radiant animation and the materials here as well. All right, so ultimately those initial settings are probably going to work well. If you notice something odd, something that maybe is weird in your in your mesh, then it's worth checking the stuff out. Uh, so and mess around with the settings. You can feel free to mess around with with with, with my objects. You can mess around with the 3D objects from uh, uh, the flappy the flappy drone game as well. Uh, extract the materials from those. Uh, the point here is just get some experience with it. Just mess around with it a little bit. Make sure you sort of understand at least the basics. And if you have a problem, then you can go a little bit deeper into it. All right, I want to talk about 2D importing as well. So the, the sprite sheet that I put up uh, on Blackboard is from Kenny's Asset Pack. Uh, if you've never heard of, of, of Kenny's before, I, I, think, I, think it's, I think it's pronounced Kenny's. I think so. Uh, let me see if we can go over there, actually. So he's at uh, Kenny NL. And these are all free. For this class, I did like the idea of folks making their own stuff. Uh, to me, it, it, it's always made it feel more like mine if I did like everything with it, if I made the graphics and the sounds and the musics. But let's say you're prototyping something. You don't want to have to go through and make a ton of assets just to see if a concept is going to be fun. So, so, so something like this. Let's say you wanted this, this little blaster, blaster kit. This is a 3D kit. It comes with all these different blasters and some targets. And you just import them right in. So it looks like it includes 2D renders and isometric views uh, as, as well. But it is because it says it said it was a 3D asset. So you bring it in, you use it as a little prototype uh, placeholder for a graphic that you might use in the future. Or maybe you like the style and you just make a whole game where you use all of Kenny's stuff. So he's got tons of stuff. There's hundreds and hundreds of, of graphics, hundreds and hundreds of little uh, uh, kits of things. So the one that I included is, is one of his. Uh, you can pay for them as well. If you pay for them, you can get all of them without downloading them individually. That's sort of the main thing. Because if, if I wanted this, I got to download it individually. I can't download everything from all of his packs at the same time. So he's got, it's, it's just, it's tons of stuff. So he's got characters and, and other models and stuff for roads and all kinds of stuff. And he has some UI ones and some audio packs as well. So he, he's got tons of stuff. This is a really, really good resource. There's six pages of 2D assets, for example. So I, I think I grabbed one from here. The one I have on the slide is actually this one, but that's not the one that I put in. There was like a Christmassy one or something that I put in. It's got like canes and candy canes and stuff in it. Uh, the one I put uh, for you guys to download. So, so Phil, feel free to use these. I still would rather you make your own stuff for like the, the, uh, uh, the, the final project. But uh, so once, once you're done with this class and you want some quick assets that you don't want to make yourself, this is a good place to do it. So that's why I'm talking about the 2D and 3D imports because you may find some assets like this and be like, all right, I want to get these in. How do you do it? How do you get all this stuff set up so that you can easily use them? For the tile map lecture, we'll also be using actually now for the tile map lecture, I, I made I made my own set of tiles. But for most of these, you could do the same sort of thing. You could use a tile map uh, lecture that we're going to talk about to place tiles down for roads and stuff for this whatever this tank game thing. So uh, this is a place that's that's worth going. I've 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 paid for all of Kenny's stuff to to support him a bit because he releases new stuff all the time. And that uh, Asset Forge program that I showed you, uh, uh, I think last week or the week before, the one that was sort of the kit bash one, it's it's done made by the same guy, so it's the it's it's Kenny's uh, uh, Asset Forge uh, program. Okay, so enough of an advertisement here. Uh, let me grab that or find that asset here. Uh, I should have it around here somewhere, and I'll show you what we can do when we drag it in. All right, all right, so I got it. So when you first drag in an image like this, so I'm going to go, I have a sprites folder. When you first drag in an image, and I'm going to just drag that sprite sheet in. So I just click on it. I have it in a folder. I'm clicking on here to drag it in. And here it is. By default, it's just an image. So I'm going to get rid of this gate here. And I'm going to drag in my little sprite sheet here. OK. I can't do that yet because it's not actually a sprite. It's actually set up as a texture. Yeah. So I'd have to like 
apply to a material and all that kind of, other kind of stuff. Okay, obviously that's not what I want to do. So the first thing to take a look at when you bring in something like this is to look at the look at the type and the shape. This is obviously a 2D texture, so we'll leave it there. And there's a couple of options here. Uh, this is not a normal map. If you've done like 3D stuff before, if you've messed around with some things, it's, it's not a normal map. It's not a cursor. It's not a light map. It's it's it's, it's not a like 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 a GUI thing, or for ed an editor GUI thing. It is a sprite. So I set this to a sprite and I say apply. And now I can actually drag it in because I've set it up. Okay, it's a sprite. I can spawn it and do all kinds of stuff with it. We're going to mess with the sprite mode in just a second. But if, as soon as I change it to a sprite, I can drag it in and there it is. Okay, that's not really what I want. I don't want all of the, all of the sprites in here. It's like a 10 by 10. So it's 100 sprites in here. I don't want 100 sprites just in one sort of sheet like this that I, that I put in. This is not what I want. And if I click on the little arrow, so in my, in, my, uh, in my project window here, if I click on the arrow, just like I did with the 3D model that showed like the materials and the mesh, here it shows my sprite. There's only one sprite. Unity sees this sprite sheet as one sprite. That's not ideal. So let's go ahead and delete this from the hierarchy. And back to the import settings. There's a sprite mode. It's set to single. That's why it's only one sprite because this is set to be a single sprite. So I want to change this to multiple. And for a lot of these settings here, especially for the import settings, you do have to click apply. So I'll click apply. But now there's no arrow anymore. It's gone. That's because I need to set sprites up and tell it what is a sprite in my sprite sheet. Because Unity doesn't know. It doesn't know what how big the sprites are. It doesn't know any information about it. You have to click on the Sprite Editor. If this did not pop up for you, and I'm not sure, I don't remember if it's default nowadays or not, in order for the Sprite Editor to be used, there's a certain package. So I'm going to go to Window, Package Manager. There's a certain package that needs to be imported. And it is the, or it needs to be installed. It is the, I think it's 2D Sprite. Yeah, it's the one I was already clicked on. So it needs to be 2D Sprite. So this for me right now is, is, is installed. I don't know if it's if it's default. Uh, I don't remember if it's default, but there's a whole bunch of 2D stuff in here. We will talk about the tile map editor in the future as well as the pixel perfect in the future. But uh, the 2D sprite is what we need in order for the sprite editor to be available. So if you didn't, if, if you clicked on sprite editor and it said like it couldn't open it up or something, then make sure you have 2D sprite, uh, the package installed. So when I click on the sprite editor, I see my sprite. This is where we slice up the image to tell Unity what is a sprite. So I should have 100 sprites here. This is a 10 by 10. So there's a few ways to do it. You can slice stuff yourself. So I can just draw a box like this, and this now becomes sprite 0. And I can draw another sprite right here, and this becomes sprite 1. So if I apply and close my window, notice I have two sprites here now. I got this sprite, and I have this sprite. That's where I drew my boxes. So that's how I did the snowman. The snowman, I had like a head, and then separated a little bit was the body. And then you know, if you added a hat or something, you could have a hat above it. I just sort of drew some boxes around the head and the body, and those were my sprites. Now, obviously, this is not what I want. And I don't want to draw 100 boxes. So Unity has a couple of things that we can do. So I'm going to come in here, and I think we can. Uh, we should be able to delete them. So if I select a if I select a sprite that I've defined, I can just delete it. It doesn't delete anything in the image. It just deletes what I'm calling a sprite. Up in the menu in the upper left of the sprite editor, there's a drop down that says slice. So we can do automatic slicing of our of our sheet here. And I'm going to have the type be grid by cell count. So it's going to make a grid of sprites based on how many sprites I want in each dimension. So this is a 10 by 10 grid. I'd, I'd already counted it out. It's 10 by 10. If you needed like an offset, if the grid didn't start until 
you know, a few pixels in, or if there's some padding, so maybe there's like five pixels of padding between each sprite, then you can deal with uh, X and Y padding as well. The pivot, I'm going to keep it center. We'll talk about that in a second. And then the method will be delete existing. So if I had other sprites in there, it would delete the, the ones that already exist. So we do 10 by 10. I'm going to say slice. And there, there is my 100 sprites. So I have all the little squares representing the sprites. The little circle, there's a tiny little circle here in the center. That's the pivot. So when I rotate this object, it will rotate around the pivot. So for the snowman, for example, or for let's say you had a 2D character or something, you probably want the pivot of their head to be at the bottom where the neck is. You don't rotate the head from the center. You rotate the head from where the neck is. Just like if you had an arm, you rotate the arm from the shoulder, not from the center of wherever the arm graphic looks like. So you can move the pivot around manually, or you can have it set when I do a slice, I could have the pivot be top left, top, top right, left, right, all the all those sort of things. So you can mess around with the with where the pivot is located, either when you automatically create the sprites, or you can manually change where the pivot is because all the information about each sprite is right down here. So I the position and the border typically you don't need to mess with, but you can change where the pivot is on an individual sprite and have the, the pivot uh, unit mode, which is uh, uh, which is basically the, the vector. How do uh, how'd you leave the original sprite selection? Yeah. So if you create some sprites that uh, you don't want, or maybe in this in this sheet, I just know that I'm never going to use the green candy cane. You can you should be able to just select a sprite, and and I was pressing the delete key. So I do this. I delete. There is no sprite here anymore. Same with up here. I can delete these guys out, and there won't be a sprite there. And Unity just won't use that part of the image because if I apply this. And they close. Now I have all these sprites. That's all packaged up still in my sprite sheet. So I can click on the arrow and there's my sprites. And I can easily add more sprites in here by just dragging them in. Again, we're going to see with the Unity tile map how we can set these up so we can just paint with them rather than having to drag them in. So that's the idea for sort of breaking these sprites up and uh, uh, using the sprite editor to chop up your sprite sheet so you can get the individual sprites out. This is probably the most common thing that you're going to do with, with 2D graphics is setting it up so you have sprites. Because typically, I, I don't want 100 files, each with a small sprite. I want one file, one larger file with all my sprites in it. So this is how you go about uh, messing around with that. So. Are there any questions so far? Any, any other questions so far? Okay. There are a few things here in the uh, sprite mode that, that you can mess with as well, things like pixels per unit. So how many pixels in the sprite sheet are going to represent one unit in Unity? So if I do something like, say, 50, I have to click Apply, because this is one part of the import settings. You'll notice that the sprites get bigger. So now it's 50 pixels per one unit in Unity. So this is an easy way to change the scale of the entire sprite sheet. If you need the sprites to be bigger overall, then just change the pixels per unit. If you need it to be smaller, change it as well. Uh, you know, if you go to, if you go to some large number, then of course they're going to get uh, smaller. Uh, so it depends on what, what what your game is and how many pixels you've used for your sprites. So if you, if you just want if you have like a 16 by 16 sprite you might want to have pixels per unit be higher than if you use 64 by 64 pixels in your sprite, if you want them to be the same relative size on the screen, for instance. So that's something that you might have to mess with. That's a very common thing to change the size of this stuff. Usually for things like mesh, mesh size, mesh type, you don't have to worry about. Extrude edges, you don't have to worry about typically. So you don't need to worry about most of these other ones here. Uh, they go along with if you're creating a, if you're creating like a, like certain amounts of colliders, or uh, if you automatically generate some of the, the sprites, you can have them be tight or a little bit looser or something. In the advanced section, if you're going to the there's this read write enable just like on the 3D model. If you're going to be editing the sprite shape in any way, uh, in in code, so so not just the normal transform stuff, but you're going to be like actually trying to grab. Uh, pieces of, of the sprite and actually deform them, then read write does need to be enabled for that. Uh, an example of that would be, uh, let's see, 
I forget the name of some of the the, the recent ones. Um, some of the games where you like have a like your player object is like a tank, and you you do like a shot, and then it like blows up some of the terrain, and you're trying to shoot the other the other player across the map. Uh, if you had something where you had to delete some of the texture to show like the the crater of an explosion, then you'd probably want the read write enabled because you're directly messing with the actual texture itself, the actual sprite itself. Uh, typically, the other ones you don't have to mess with. Uh, alpha is transparency is usually checked yes. So if you have a transparent part of an image, which is what this has. All the background, the checkered background here is where the transparency is. That is an alpha channel. So remember, we have RGB alpha. So the alpha channel there is zero. So typically saying alpha is transparency is, is, is what you want. And the alpha source, what is the source of the alpha channel? Typically, you will have input texture alpha. If you have just a grayscale image and you want you want black to be like transparent and white to be uh, opaque, then you can say from gay, from grayscale. So there's, there's a couple of other ones here to mess with. The last little bit here deals with what happens when you either need to tile the texture. So for example, in a shader, what happens if you put the time, the, the tiling and offset node and have the time try to scroll through the the texture, does it mirror? Does it repeat? Does it clamp? So in other words, if it clamps, it does not actually able to, to do the tiling. Uh, is it only per axis? Does it mirror just one time? So some options for that. Clamp is usually going to be your best friend unless you need it to do some sort of tiling if you're putting it into a shader or something. Uh, the filter mode, we're going to take a look at, at a close-up look at one of these sprites, and I'm going to show you what this filter mode thing does. So here's what here's what our sprite looks like. It's a little bit blurry. If we change the filter mode to point, notice how we can see the individual pixels now. So bilinear and trilinear, they're both going to look about the same. They're a filter mode so that it, so that it sort of blurs your your uh, your pixels. That could be good for a more realistic looking texture. But if you're making, say, a pixel art style game, you do not want to have a bilinear or trilinear filtered on it. So if you're doing a pixel art game or you want to be able to see the individual block pixels, then you need to use the point, no filters. Some people call it the point filter, but it's essentially no filter. So we can actually see the sort of each pixel itself rather than them just being sort of blurred together. So oftentimes I'll just put the point filter on and then later if I decide I want to have that sort of more smooth look, then I'll go back to the filter mode. mode. But if this is imperative if you want to do any sort of pixel art uh, with your graphics. And notice point mode was not the default setting. So if you ever tried to do uh, pixel art games in Unity and you're like, why is this so blurry? What the heck's going on? That's, that's most likely the reason. The area down here is the default settings for resizing and some of the format stuff of your image. These are default. For different types of builds, you can change the default. So maybe if your game is built for PC, your max size of your, your sprite could be larger. Whereas if it's on Android or on WebGL, maybe you want it smaller. Maybe you want it to be more compressed on an Android than on a PC. So you can set the defaults, and then you can decide if you want to override some of these settings for PC, Mac, or Linux, for Android. I, I, only, I don't have iOS build support here, so that's why I don't have one of those tabs. But if you, if you had an iOS build support, you would have a tab for iOS as well. So any of the build supports that you installed with Unity, you will have a tab for them here. The max size doesn't really do a whole lot, depending on how big your texture actually is, how big your sprite sheet, your entire sprite sheet actually is. Keeping it at 20, uh, 2048 by 2048 is fine. So it sort of does sort of, sort of square. It, this is usually fine. This is a, effectively a 2K texture. Uh, I'm going to show you what happens when you drop it way down. So let's drop it down to 32. So the maximum size that I'm allowing, actually, maybe we'll make it a little bit bigger. The maximum size that I'm allowing for this sprite sheet is 128. So if I click Apply, now it's very pixelated because it's taking that entire sprite sheet and shrinking it down to just 128 pixels. 
on the on, on the actual on the actual spreadsheet itself. So all this stuff is very pixelated, tougher to tell on the on the blocks here, but uh, much easier to tell on this. And we, we notice we actually get a little bit of overlap here. There's some green here. This is because the sprites are right up against each other, and so we're actually getting a little bit of bleed from the sprite that's directly above this one. So it can be a little dangerous to do this, but the algorithm to resize, you have a couple to pick here. So if we change it to bilinear, we'll get a little bit different result than the Mitchell resizing. So it resizes your texture down to the size. Typically, you probably want to have this either large or close to the size of your image itself. So this total image here is 700 by 700. So I change it to 1024. This should be fine. So ideally, it should be somewhere around the size of your actual image itself. Uh, the format of the colors in your image. Automatic is usually fine. I've never really had a reason to change it from automatic. But for this particular texture, it's probably an RGBA 32-bit. And then we could just, you could leave it at that. But if you do automatic, there's a couple things you can do here with compression. So you could be like, all right, let's see, do I, do I want to have some compression on here? For pixel art, you probably want no compression. And for larger textures, if you're, if you're using like 4K textures, you might want high compression on Android or something. So these are just things that you can change based on the file itself and the format that your, your colors and stuff are in. So uh, yeah, so again, with pixel art, I never use, I never use compression. Uh, I try to put this at either whatever my, whatever around whatever my, my pics, my image size is, or potentially lower if you want to, if you wanted to uh, see if that sampling is OK, although it's not always because you get some bleed from uh, other nearby uh, other nearby ones. Uh, and then uh, uh, yeah, and then and then the rest of it, uh, you can usually just sort of keep uh, keep uh, as, as automatic. All right. All right, Nathan. So yeah, so in the in the sprite editor, uh, I used for the slice up here, I used grid by cell count and Counting out the cells, there's it's, it's a 10 by 10. So we do 10 columns, 10 rows. If there was any padding, which is what you would need to get rid of that bleeding sort of effect that I, that I showed, you'd want some padding between the cells. So you'd want to make sure that there was you know, 5, 10 pixels between each sprite and that you could include that in here. So you can do grid by cell, by, by cell count, or you can do grid by cell size. So here, they're 70 by 70, because this is a 700 by 700 uh, sheet. So you, so you could say 70 by 70 pixels, and it would still fill this in the same way. And of course, you could keep uh, you could keep empty ones if if uh, if Unity notices that there are no pixels in a particular cell or where it would be. You could keep those empty ones if you wanted to. Here, it's off, so there's no there's no actual uh, uh, sprites in this empty region that's over on the right. You can say slice, and we've got them all back. And after you do this, make sure you press apply up here. So it'll save, I'll save it. All this data goes into the metadata file. So if you see a if you see a sprite in your Unity folder and you see the same name, but it says dot meta at the end, the metadata for where the sprites are is actually in that file. So if you want to give somebody else your sprite sheet and the way that you've chopped your sprites up, you want to give them this the 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 original image and the metadata file as well. Uh, otherwise, you're not going to have any info about the sprites themselves. All right, so that's that's sort of your basic intro for sort of reading in these uh, these these sort of two D and and three D objects. Uh, obviously, sprites are a little bit less uh, intensive, but there are some things to remember here that that you should typically do. So my my default sort of the uh, my my default sort of settings are. Whether sprite mode is multiple or single is going to depend on, on what you mess with or on how you how you write your sprites. Uh, mess around with the sprite editor to get your sprites uh, all mapped out. And then I typically just do point mode automatically to start with, and I'll change it later if I need to. And I'll come, come in here and try to make the size either large or close to the size of my actual image itself. And then I put usually put no compression on and keep the format uh, automatic. So those are just the, the things to remember. You will you will likely forget some of these. So you know you you do some pixel art and then you bring it in and you're like, yeah, it's blurry, it sucks. So that that's that that's just really to, to sort of uh, trigger a oh I need to go to point mode. So hopefully that's uh, that's that's something that uh, uh, that you, you can remember based on based on uh, the lecture today. 
uh, in the slides. Uh, I just have a, basically a few of these things uh, uh, mentioned here. So this one was, just, I think it's like a roadway sort of sprite sheet that we might use uh, a little bit later on. Uh, you can create as many sprites as you want. Uh, filter mode, max size, compression, all those things we talked about. Uh, yeah. Again, typically you don't have to change a lot of these settings. This should just be a couple that, that you mess with. So that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, might have been able to fit the, this lecture and last lecture together all at once, but I didn't want to sort of really have to rush through everything. So uh, hopefully that was at least somewhat useful uh, when you work on your final project. If you want to do some 3D arts, if you want to combine 3D art and 2D art, uh, you'll have a little bit more insight into how to get these things imported and hopefully working for you. Uh, we're going to do our third game starting next week. It's going to have several... Uh, several design patterns. Uh, it's going to have uh, some enemies and a boss and a couple of uh, uh, a couple of state machines and stuff. So uh, it, it'll, it will be a bit more complicated. You're going to see a bit more features of C Sharp and a, a, a few more design patterns that will hopefully help you out in the future as well. And then I think after that, it's like three weeks of that, although Thanksgiving's in there. So uh, I only have like maybe five lectures of it. Uh, and then the final project uh, little game jam weekend is, is going to be coming up. We will likely not have a homework based on the third game. So, so it's not something that uh, uh, you have to, you have to really keep up with, but the design patterns I think are, are super useful. So uh, I think it's still worth messing around with. Uh, and then I think there's a couple of just wrap up lectures. Uh, one of them being the tile map lecture. And if we have time, which I actually don't think we do, but if we have time, I might do like a miscellaneous lecture or a AI nav mesh uh, lecture. So that's sort of what's coming up. We don't have sort of a ton of, of weeks left. So uh, we'll see if we can make, make the best of, of, of what we got left. So that is all for today. So uh, I will see you guys. Uh, I'll see you guys next uh, week. Have a um, good weekend. Professor, real quick, um, what weekend was that? Uh, was the jam going to be again? Sorry. Um, yeah, let me grab the syllabus here because I don't exactly remember. I didn't want to have it too late, so it would potentially interfere with the. Oops, that is completely the wrong course. Oh, if it's accurate to the syllabus, then uh, it should be all right. Um, yeah, but I can, I, I can, I have I can it. sort of mention when it's. Uh, So, so yeah, so I have it on week 13. Uh, week 12 is Thanksgiving. Oh, okay. So week 13 would be that weekend after Thanksgiving. My intention was sort of a Friday through Monday sort of thing, but that's something we can definitely mm -hmm. talk about. Uh, PA3, like I said, will likely not be happening. Uh, so so I don't necessarily want something due after the after the sort of final project game jam thing. So, so uh, we, we likely so, will do that. And then I'll so have be the final presentation on their game jam project. Okay. So that would be the weekend, so not like after December. like Thanksgiving, but like the weekend following it. Yeah. So, so, so yeah, you have your, you have your Thanksgiving break, do all that stuff. And then okay. the weekend after the Thanksgiving break should be, you should be. This is so like fifth or sixth, yeah. I think it was. All right. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate it. Have a good day. See ya. Bye. Thanks, Professor. Have a good one. Yep. See ya. Um, professor, quick question. Yep. If we wanted to download your videos, the recorded ones, to possibly watch them later, um, would we be able to do that? I think so. Uh, I've been not, using... Panop not... doesn't allow that. Um, I, I wonder if there's any other way that you know that you could do it. So let's see. So it does allow, at the very least, it just allowed me to do it. Um, when you click, do you, do you have the option? Do you have the option here, the download thing? Yeah, I think it's only for you, I guess. Okay. I can see if I can mess around with some of those settings. Let's see if I can mess around with some of those settings. Because I do have to mess around with the settings so anybody can view it. Mm -hmm. If I can't get something changed to allow that, I'll see if I can download them and put them up somewhere. Gotcha. Thanks, Professor. Appreciate it. Yep. Um, this is kind of probably a little late to ask, but um, would it be possible to have a uh, independent study for um, 
parallel programming next semester or? Um, I'll have to look at some of the schedule stuff. Uh, I already have, so I already have four, I already have, I'm already sort of teaching four classes because there's mm -hmm. a grad class that I have to teach part of as well. Um, and I don't know exactly, there were some, with, with the restructuring, so we had the restructuring from like department to school stuff. Mm -hmm. And with that, there was some talk at the last department or the last school meeting. It used to be department meeting. Let's talk, talk at the last school meetings about independent studies and exactly how those work now, because there was some stuff that came down from the president and the provost about independent studies um, and, and sort of changes happening to them. So I'll, I'll see, send, send me an email and I'll ask, uh, I'll ask our, I'll ask the Dean if, if that stuff that we talked about at the meeting is still, uh, is still going on. I don't, I don't, I don't want to like spread misinformation. So I, so yeah. I don't want to say like any more than that, but there was some stuff that was talked about uh, mm -hmm. at various meetings. So send, send me an email today and I'll see if I can find out from uh, Charlie. Okay. Uh, it's more, it, it, it's not too urgent. If I don't get the independent studies, um, uh, my co-ops are all set. I would just take another co-op to fill in the spring semester and I'll finish in the summer. But if I am able to get the independent studies, then I would do parallel programming and I'll have to talk with uh, Professor Kramendahl um, for uh, the other one gotcha. and take senior project. And that will be enough for a full-time student and to graduate. Gotcha. Okay. Yes, yeah, send, send, send me that and, and men, mention that in the, in the email as well, so I can I can relay that to Charlie when I asked him about the independent studies because there was it, it was it was just it was it was something that it has to do with like the the faculty federation and stuff as well. So there was mm -hmm. a big thing related to it over the past okay. uh, couple months. So. But send send me all that info and I will I will ask Charlie. Okay. All right. Thank you. Kevin, do you have a do you have a question?